If we're going to conduct research in social psychology, we're going to use the scientific method just like we would in any other type of research that we would be conducting. One of the reasons why people think social psychology is common sense is that we learn about the outcome of a given event. Uh, when we read about like re results of a research project, we fre frequently believe that we would have been able to predict the outcome of ahead of time, right? Like we talked about hindsight bias in the last lecture. If half of the class of students is told that research concerning attraction between people has dem demonstrated that opposites attract, and the other half is told that research has demonstrated birds of a feather flock together, most of the students in both groups will report believing that the outcome is true and that they would have predicted the outcome before they had heard about it. But of course, both of these contradictory outcomes cannot be true, right? Either opposites attract or birds of a feather flock together. The problem is that just reading a description of research findings leads us to think of the many cases that we know that support the findings and thus makes them seeing, seem more believable, right? And that's where we get the hindsight bias, right? So we have to do more research, right? Uh, <clears throat> social psychologists conduct research because it often uncovers results that could not have been predicted ahead of time. Putting our hunches to the test exposes our ideas to scrutiny. The scientific approach brings a lot of surprises, but it also helps us test our explanations about behavior in a rigorous manner. So it's important for you to understand the research methods used in psychology so that you can evaluate the validity of the research that you read about here, as well as other courses and in everyday life. Social psychologists put their research in scientific journals, you know, and some of which you'll read uh, in different articles as we move through class. A theory comes after we've done the research and predicted and observed different events. Theories allow us to make a lot of observations, clear predictions. You know, we do this through the use of a hypothesis, something that's testable, something that describes the relationship between different um, events. It allows us to test the theory that we're trying to prove. It gives us direction in the research that we're trying to do and hopefully can make that theory that we're trying to prove practical. Often we write hypotheses in an if-then statement. Um, you know, <clears throat> if we're going to observe people who loot property or attack others, they often do so in groups or crowds. We can theorize that being part of a crowd or group makes individuals feel anonymous and lower their inhibitions. So is this something that we could test? You know, your book talks about this example. You know, we could ask individuals and groups to administer punishing shocks to someone who wouldn't know who's actually shocking them. Are they more likely to do this or not? You know, then if they were just acting alone, would they do this in a group versus doing this by themselves? You know, these are things that we might be interested in testing. Uh, you're, if you're reading the Myers book, there are examples like this in there. Sampling is an important part of the research process, right? Uh, it's a representative, we get a representative sample of the population that we're testing, right? We often do this in a random sample method. A simple random sample is a subset of a population, it's meaning that every member of that population has an exactly equal chance of being selected. This is the most straightforward probability sampling method. It involves a single random selection and requires little advanced knowledge about the population. Because it uses randomization, any research performed on this sample should have high internal and external validity. Simple random sampling is used to make statistical inferences about a population. It helps to ensure high internal validity. Randomization is the best method to reduce the impact of potential confounding variables. If you're gonna use a simple random sampling, 
you have to have a complete list of every member of the population for whatever it is you're testing. You can contact or access each member of the population if they're selected, and you have the time and resources to collect data from the necessary sample size. Uh, there's other types of sampling, probability sampling, such as systematic sampling, stratified sampling, cluster sampling. So you know, we, we do have other options, but this simple random sampling is the one that we use the most. The other part is, you know, the question wording is so important when we write surveys to make sure that participants can understand what it is that they're being asked. We want to make sure that there's no bias written in the questions. We want to make sure how we frame the questions, you know, how they're posed so that, again, participants know what it is that you're asking of them, um, you know, something that they're not asking or needing to ask how to rephrase different things. Um, we want to avoid things that are like double barreled questions, we call it, where we're asking like a question within a question, those types of things we want to avoid. So correlational research or experimental research. The goal of correlational research is to search for and test the hypothesis about relationships between two or more variables. It's the simplest case. The correlation is between only two variables, such as between similarity and liking, or between gender and helping, male versus female. In a correlational design, the research hypothesis is that there's an association, right? There's a correlation that's made between the variables that's being measured. We see this a lot with the violent video games and aggressive behavior. You know, there's always correlations that are trying to be made between those that play violent video games and also show aggressive behavior, right? Those would be correlational research studies that are done. Uh, <clears throat> then experimental research, the goal of much research in social psychology is to understand the casual relationships among variables. And for this, we use experimental research designs. These are research designs that include the manipulation of a given situation or experience for two or more groups of individuals who are initially created to be equivalent followed by a measurement of the effect of that experience. And so we have to use variables. So our independent and dependent, the independent variable refers to the situation that's created by the experimenter through the experimental manipulation. And the dependent variable is what's being measured. So when you look at an experimental research, if you can see, identify what's different between your two groups, your experimental group and your control group, that's your independent right because you're independent what's being manipulated is applied to the experimental group your control group is given a placebo it's not applied to the control group your dependent variable is what is being measured what is the outcome what do you want to know from the groups uh, <clears throat> so if we um, look at the you know violent video games and aggressive behavior again you know we would um, give the experimental group a violent video game to play and we give the control group you know just a regular video game to play uh, let each group play for x amount of time and then give them a competitive task you know the same task that they have to complete afterwards and try and decipher which one you know shows more aggressive in the ta more aggression in the task at hand once they're done With correlation and causation, a correlation refers to the relationship between two statistical variables. The variables are dependent on each other, they change together. A positive correlation of two variables means that um, an increase in A will also lead to an increase in B. The correlation is undirected. Um, so if B changes, A changes, you know, if B goes up, A goes up, if A goes down, B goes down, you know, the slope doesn't necessarily matter. Causation, on the other hand, describes a cause and effect relationship. There's a causation between A and B. So it means that the increase in A is also the cause of the increase in B. The difference becomes quickly um, clearer here with this example. So let's say a study could very likely find a positive correlation 
between a person's risk of skin cancer and the number of times they visit an outdoor pool. So if a person visits the outdoor pool frequently, then their risk of developing skin cancer also increases. It's a clear positive correlation, but there's also a causation between outdoor swimming pool visits and skin cancer. Uh, <clears throat> or is there, a pos is there also a causation, sorry, between outdoor swimming pool visits and skin cancer? Probably not, because that would mean that only outdoor swimming pool visits are the cause of the increase of skin cancer, right? So we can't say that outdoor swimming pools cause cancer, right? So there's a correlation there, but not a causation. It's much more likely that people who spend time in outdoor swimming pools are also exposed to significantly more sunlight if they don't take sufficient, uh, sufficient precautions with sunscreen or similar, um, something similar, the more sunburns can occur. This can increase the risk of skin cancer. So there's a clear correlation between swimming pool visits and skin cancer, but the risk is not um, necessarily a causation. Right. Uh, <clears throat> in the example here, you see the correlation um, between social status and health and self-esteem and academic achievement. But in the blue box, you know, there's other factors that could influence this, right? So you see the arrows going in different directions because there are other things that could influence this, right? So the correlations, but, you know, not a causation because there's other things that could um, underlying effects here. I'll let you just kind of read through this, um, but just think about, you know, the research questions are presented here. So are early maturing children more confident? Can you participants be randomly assigned to this condition? No, um, it's a correlational research question. So we can't just randomly assign people. Um, it's not experimental. So there's no independent variable. There's no dependent variable because it's not experimental. Right. So there's a few more for you to read through. And then there's two of them for you to try on your own and see if you can come up with what you think the answers would be. All right, if you need more time, you can just pause this. Otherwise, let's continue. So the most common method of creating equivalence among the experimental conditions is through random assignment to conditions. This involves determining separately for each participant which condition he or she will experience through a random process, such as drawing numbers out of an envelope. Um, there is a website also that's uh, http colon slash slash randomizer.org. Um, <clears throat> so you can randomly assign, you know, let's say 100 participants to each of their two groups. We call them group A and group B. Use the random assignment to conditions. Um, they could be, you could be confident that before the experimental manipulation occurred, students in group A were on average equivalent to students in group, group B on every possible variable out there, um, including variables that are likely to be related, related to like the aggression that we talked about earlier, such as families, peers, hormone levels, diet, everything else you can think of. As long as all the groups are equivalent to one another in group A and group B, you know, all the participants are good to move forward. And then you can compare the dependent variable with the two groups um, but you would do this, you know, random assignment to both groups in order to split the groups equally. But you have to do it, you know, to randomly so that you're not favoring, you know, one group getting into group A, you know, and favoring this other group 
or this other person getting into group B, right? You want to be fair about it. You want to avoid any kind of bias getting in. So we would try and do this through the random assignment. We always have to look at ethics and experimentation, and that's, you know, what the APA is for as well. American Psychological Association has put forth a lot of ethical um, guidelines that we need to follow when we do any kind of experimentation, right, to make sure, you know, first and foremost is do no harm to your participants. But when we look at mundane and experimental realism, uh, mundane realism is measured of uh, external validity or the extent to which experimental findings can be generalized to the real world. So it asks how close to real life are the materials and procedures used in a certain study. So for example, a study on memory would ask participants to memorize a list of three letter nonsense words. A test of mundane realism would ask how similar to real life memory tasks is the activity and can the findings of such an experiment be applied to real life memory tasks. Experimental realism is another name for situations of augmented reality um, or inst instrumental realism where a place or a setting has been altered or modified to include new and or experimental services, systems, and devices. In these settings, subjects are exposed to new technologies and are observed interacting with the new technology to determine how attractive, user-friendly they are. It is also realism to the extent of which the experimental reality seems genuine and impactful to the subjects of the experiment. Uh, this can be in part deceptive towards persons that are participating in the research. Um, we create situations sometimes in social psychology that can be very impactful to participants. Uh, we look at like Stanley Milgram's classic investigation of obedience where the participants were instructed to administer a series of electric shocks to the Confederates, even though no shocks were actually administered. You know, this is supposed to be in part a learning study. Participants acted as teachers. They were instructed by the experimenter to administer shocks uh, of intensity, increasing intensity for every wrong response offered by the Confederate. You know, even though the events of the study were highly artificial, um, and it is certainly far from normal to administer shocks to another human uh, under the instruction of an experimental psychologist, you know, that the reality of the situation and the participants became extremely invested in it and, you know, it all seemed very real. The participants took that experimental process, you know, seriously. They responded naturally. They shuddered and laughed nervously. They obeyed. They administered increasing levels of shock and you know, or, um, and they were in this sterile laboratory setting, you know, they were in this legitimate testing ground for examining human, human obedience and this very realistic, you know, ex, um, situation for them, you know, very unethical by today's standards, but not at that time. Informed consent is a part of the ethical guidelines making sure that the participant wants to participate that they agree to be there that they were not forced or coerced in any way um, so they need to be there of their own free will they need to be protected from harm which is why milgram's study is considered unethical today because the participants were technically in harm's way due to the uh, stress levels of administering those shocks and then there's a debriefing which in some of Milgram's footage, or at least in some of the footage of the, the I guess, updated version of his experiment, um, you see the participants being debriefed. So, you know, immediately when they said, hey, I've had enough, for the few that did, uh, they were told immediately, you know, that they were not administering shocks and, you know, kind of what the situation was and what the experiment was about. I think what's most shocking on this slide is that most research participants are from cultures that represent only 12% of humanity. Most of our research is done on the Western world, meaning the United States, um, Europe, and Australia. 
we do not have a lot of research that comes out of our underdeveloped or developing nations. It's important to realize that the understanding of social behavior that we gain by conducting research is a very slow, gradual, and cumulative process. The research findings of one scientist or one experiment do not stand alone. No one study proves a theory or a research hypothesis. Rather, research is designed to build on, add to, and expand the existing research that has been conducted by other scientists. That is why whenever a scientist decides to conduct research, he or she first reads journal articles and book chapters describing existing research in the domain and then designs his or her research on the basis of the prior findings. The result of the cumulative process is that over time, research findings are used to create a systematic set of knowledge about social psychology.